Hello, good morning everyone and welcome to this webinar, Bus Back Better, the need for quality roadside infrastructure. I'm Louise Collins, Senior Stakeholder Manager at Transport Focus. We're the Independent Transport User Watchdog and I'm really pleased to be here today to chair this session. And we're going to talk about that really important but often overlooked topic of roadside infrastructure. Um, I'm joined by four fantastic panellists today. We've got Jonathan Morley, Ivan Bennett, Claire Haig and Ed Griffiths. Each panellist is going to talk on the topic for about 10 minutes or so, setting out their views. And at the end of those presentations, we're going to get into a debate, so a good question and answer session. So welcome to everyone in the online audience. I believe we've had more than 300 people registered, so a great audience today. We really want to hear from you, so please get your questions in. Um, there's a question function, so you can pop them in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. The session is being recorded. You can watch it on YouTube later and we'll provide some more details about that later on. So with that, let's get straight on to hear from our first speaker and it's over to Jonathan Morley. Morning, Louise, many thanks. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, this particular topic is a topic that uh, myself as an individual and um, certainly my my colleagues at Trueform have been trying to push for many, many years now. And um, it's trying to uh, raise awareness of the subject of the roadside infrastructure um, being a, a key and valuable strategic investment in the promotion of the bus network. Um, we're going to go through with a few examples and some of the other speakers will be showing some sort of real um, live case scenarios. Um, and some data that, that sort of supports what I'm going to say uh, throughout my presentation. Um, in the photograph here, we've got Partick Interchange. Now, this particular um, set of um, infrastructure was designed by um, architects Austin Smith Lords and uh, was manufactured and installed by us at Trueform. Uh, but it gives an, an, just an example of how things can be done well. And if we can just move to the next slide, you can see examples of what the problem is. So this whole presentation really is about what, you know, what is the problem? What do the public see and how we can make transformational change in the roadside infrastructure? So these here are just examples. I mean, some of them are actually made by Trueform some years ago, but these is a typical example of what is being purchased by cities, towns, um, uh, transport authorities around the country. And um, what really needs to be recognised is what sort of image is being portrayed here in these, um, in these particular uh, um, um, installations on the side of the street. Uh, they're old fashioned, they're dirty, outdated. <clears throat> quite frankly, they're, they're quite terrible in terms of modern expectations from a customer. And that's what obviously um, a uh, bus passenger is. They're either a customer that's an existing customer, they're using the bus already, or we're trying to um, convert people that don't currently use the bus into bus users. Um, not, nothing that, certainly from my perspective and the perspective of many of the clients that we deal with uh, throughout the UK and overseas, would regard this as promoting the bus and quite the opposite, we, we consider it being a significant deterrent in um, getting people to use the bus. <clears throat> so if you could just move on. So effectively, what do we do? What we, what we need to try and create um, in our experience is a high quality modern um, environment that will encourage modal shift. Um, the bus shelter really is the shop window for the bus. Um, it's the first thing that people see. It's a very first touch point and it's obviously often the last touch point. So you, you board um, the bus via the bus shelter and when you leave the bus, more often than not, it's via the bus stop and the bus shelter. And very much the customer experience begins and ends therefore at the bus shelter. We can move on. So it's in terms of you know, why I'm talking today and what Trueform does, so we've got a sort of very really long background and a lot of experience in working with uh, transport authorities throughout the world. We've got about 150,000 installations worldwide. And really what we do is focus on the design and manufacture installation of transport, predominantly bus, but all forms of transport mobility. And we've gained over that period of time a considerable experience at what the customer wants or the user wants in terms of their infrastructure. If we move on, please. So, I mean, in terms of what we do, whilst we work with towns, cities, uh, transport authorities, local authorities, we also work 
in, in a lot of detail with architects, consultants, designers and planners internationally. And I think that's one of the messages I'm going to draw out here. And obviously we've got Ed and Ivan speaking as well, is that um, quite often uh, there's an emphasis on buying the cheapest product, buying a product that maybe is on someone's website. Um, but uh, in many other industries and, and forms, you would always employ an expert, someone that knows what they're doing in terms of providing a particular structure or a particular product that has an end use. And I think that's something that we don't see as often as we should in transport infrastructure. There's an emphasis on buying the cheapest product, perhaps from an internet site or something, and not much thought given to what's that product saying and, and, and what, what could that product do in enhancing the roadside infrastructure. So as I say, we've got a significant amount of experience over certainly 30 plus years at dealing with transport authorities, not just throughout the UK, but overseas. And um, yeah, many of the things that we've done, which I'll come on to in the following slides, um, show that some of the key stuff that we've done. And just quickly moving on, so here we go. So on the left-hand side is Partick Interchange again, great example of providing a, a sort of high class waiting environment. And I think it's worth making the, the sort of distinction at this point when we say roadside infrastructure, we're very much talking about bus stops and shelters, but in other forms of mobility, they would be regarded as a, uh, a mobility lounge or a departure lounge or a waiting room. And I think if you started to talk about a bus shelter as a departure lounge, as we would for an airport or a, um, a mobility um, a departure lounge, you would then start to question a lot more about what well, is what's being provided currently actually fitting the bill and meeting customer expectations. The one in the centre is work that we did a few years ago with Las Vegas. So we provided um, all of the uh, roadside infrastructure for Las Vegas for the bus network and also for the bus rapid transit network. On the right hand side is um, a, a series of infrastructure and a contract we've got uh, with a, um, a transport agency called King County in Seattle. Again, that was an architect design product. Uh, this is a suite of furniture that goes with the shelter waiting environment to create um, a feeling and a, a marketing platform for the promotion of the bus. And if we move on, another few examples. So again, in Seattle again, so the product on the left-hand side is the SWIFT BRT scheme that we've manufactured. And we've done a series of these routes and successfully being re-awarded uh, contracts to deliver extensions to the route um, on the SWIFT BRT again. And this is for community transit in Seattle. In the middle there is examples of stuff we've done for Paisley, um, a bespoke design, uh, designed to create um, a bit more of a wow factor in terms of roads and infrastructure and providing uh, the relevant lighting and uh, um, courtesy lighting and seating that's required for the public. And on the right hand side, um, obviously this is again produced some time ago, again in Scotland, this is Dundee, and we were commissioned to manufacture and install a whole suite of very, very upscale shelters with very rich materials. Um, uh, the, the environment when you walk inside these shelters is very much the sort of feeling you get when you walk into a hotel reception. And that's exactly what Dundee City Council wanted. They wanted the product to give the feeling that the bus um, or bus as a form of mobility um, was a very progressive and, and uh, forward way of looking at transport and in, um, in keeping with other expectations. So if we could just move on, please. So in terms of what I, my background as an individual and the team that work at Trueform, I'm a, a product designer by training and um, we've created a Trueform um, sort of legacy projects really that's very much led from design. It's understanding how our public transport products uh, were perceived, how they're presented and how they're promoted. And really it's all about attracting customers and increasing sales. And whilst we're all, we regard ourselves as transport mobility professionals, deep down we're, we're sales, marketing and design professionals because we're just trying to promote the bus service. You know, we know it's a great form of, of um, uh, mobility. Um, it's trying to compete, particularly in the, the recent years with a whole host of other new and emerging forms of mobility, which are all great, but the bus still remains a, a, a key and very cost-effective way uh, of, of uh, mobility and we, we use user-centric design principles that some of the other speakers will talk at in a bit more detail but it's effectively not just about marketing a product but it's using design principles such that the products are designed such that they're products that people want to use you know they they create customers in the fact that they exist in the way they exist um, moving on 
so our objectives as a company but all our objectives of all of the clients we work with are all the same we're all the obvious things we've heard time and time again they want to increase bus ridership they want to in increase and retain modal shift and they want to increase sales uh, so fare box sales and obviously we read a lot about it you know a lot of places have been hit quite badly by covid how do we get people back onto public transport well we need to provide infrastructure that people want to use and obviously the other byproducts um, of providing you know a bus infrastructure and a bus network that people want to use are obvious to us all um just moving on <clears throat> so we well our main task in what we do for our clients is removing barriers we identify what are the barriers preventing people using the bus network and often these are physical barriers but they can often be perceived barriers and another way of looking at it we call them points of friction and there are many points of friction in people using the bus it could be the we'll come on to these in a minute it could be the you know, the cleanliness in the bus it could be the the, the the journey time the time waiting within the bus shelter um, but effectively what we try and do is we do our bit at the beginning we regard ourselves as experts in the infrastructure and there's obviously plenty of other experts in the bus market that deal with the other parts of the bus experience but we like to consider ourselves key in delivering the end-to-end -end bus experience and again the message improving the customer experience improving the image of bus um, via the infrastructure is a key part of that and again very very simplistic um, a graphic here but you can see that you know in any walk of life whether it's a customer or us as individuals we always tend to take the path of least resistance and whether that's direct to the car or other forms of mobility whether it's train or whatever but you know we must recognize that for, for passengers to board the bus they always have to interact with a bus stop or bus shelter in one way shape or form and then really um whilst i can't applaud enough what's been done in terms of uh, dot and the bus back better uh, document um you know internally a true for myself can't help but think that it was a significantly missed opportunity so whilst you look at there's a page here and there's um, a, a number of uh, references within the documents about examples of barriers preventing uh, better bus travel there was very very limited mention at all um, of the importance and the important role that the roadside infrastructure can play and that's something that's a key point in today's webinar is that not only do we want transport authorities and cities to understand that you know, this is a real key um, thing to improve and a real sort of um, product in your armory that you can use to increase usage of bus but also we want people to sort of stand up and take notice and think well look if we produce you know another version of bus back better or similar documents it really needs to include a significant section into this this often significantly overlooked topic and then you know i think it's worthwhile looking at what the customer's expectation actually means so i don't think anybody will particularly disagree that on the left hand side there you have a picture of a bus from the 1980s and the ones on the right hand side is obviously a modern day bus that's obvious to see next image is the same left hand side 1960s bus in london on the right hand side a contemporary bus and again on the next slide if you look at the motor vehicle industry it's a ford fiesta but it's obvious that one is from the 80s and one's from the current day it's obvious to see if you move on it's not so obvious with bus shelters so the one on the left you can tell by what the lady there's wearing it's obvious and the vehicle in the background it's obviously from the 1960s 70s but the one on the right is a recently installed bus shelter but as far as the general public are concerned it's exactly the same the same on the left here that's a you know this is a sort of shelter that we tend to see on the side of the road in the uk on the right hand side we can criticize the design of it but at least it looks significantly more contemporary than the one on the left hand side it's much more in keeping with modern expectations and again there's two types of target that we need to try and attract and we try hard to reach out to both of these people there's the existing bus users that may need use the bus once twice a week regularly infrequently we want to change that to power user but there's a massive body of people that don't use the bus and uh, we want to encourage them to start using the bus and again you know customers make an informed decision but when they're thinking about the bus they're also thinking about the bus shelter that's going to be one of the first things that comes to mind i've got to catch the bus or oh, but hang on a minute i've got to stand inside that bus shelter it's a significantly important point that they think about and again just to quickly go through 
it's a marketing platform. It's a it's an uh, it's a position uh, on the street which regarded as an advertising point. It's the first touch point. It's the customer experience. All the things I've said, but it's the shop window that's the key word. <clears throat> and again, what we want is for people to desire to use the bus shelter. It's not just a case of using it because they have to. We want people to use it. One of your previous land or presentations focused on buses that people wanted to use and wanted to be seen on. This is exactly the same. We want people to choose the bus because they choose the shelter and use the shelter. And if you go to the this next one says we want people to it want it we want well we want the shelter to lure people in to attract people we want it to engage with people we want them to desire to use the bus nothing about majority of the infrastructure we put on the streets of the uk wants people or gives people the desire to use the bus uh, customer research my other speakers will talk more in detail about this i mean the single most uh, criticised point of the bus still remains 16% there is the journey time but if you extrapolate out all of the other areas that relate to the at stop experience it drives 21% of the overall bus customer satisfaction scores that's with existing users and as we see on the next image uh, these are you know we've we undertake extensive research ourselves is why people don't want to use the bus and there's a whole host of reasons and people have different personal circumstance why they don't use it there's a whole load on the left hand side, which are ones that we all understood, sorry, are all already understood and we understand like journey time, et cetera, et cetera. But on the right hand side, there's significant barriers uh, that makes up 32% and, and more actually in the figures that we've got that relate to the bus shelter environment. Uh, historical marketing challenges we've already spoken about. Um, the significant lack of uh, the infrastructure meeting modern expectations, but it also leads to feelings of vulnerability, people feeling, um, quite frankly, that they, there's a, a feeling of poor self-worth and poor social standing if they're stood under a very time-expired, old-fashioned, dilapidated bus shelter. And again, customer expectations. We all know when we go to a modern shopping centre, there's a particular experience that you, that, that you, you get when you go there and, and the retail companies work hard to give you that. Um, examples here of what we're competing with. So the bus is competing with rail, it's competing with air travel, it's competing with the underground. The left hand side there is Western Concourse at King's Cross. Magnificent welcoming experience. Uh, bottom left is a departure lounge at Heathrow that, that we've created. You've got the Heathrow um, connected autonomous pod vehicle waiting rooms and departure lounge. And the right hand side you've got Canary Wharf. Significantly different experience than what we're providing the bus passengers currently. And then I won't go into these all detail, but there's a significant lack of investment. And it, I think it stems from a lack of understanding from people that, you know, they need to apply for additional funding. It needs to be front and centre of any strategy in terms of increasing ridership. Um, there's a, as I said earlier, there's a, there's, a, there's a number of suppliers that are happy to sell any product that they can. They tend to be very basic products that are easy to manufacture. They're at a cheap price. And a local authority or a city and a town would often buy a product of that nature for a tick in a box. We need a bus shelter here. We'll buy a bus shelter. The bus shelter gets installed. That's our job done. But it's actually doing nothing to encourage or enhance bus ridership. And then really, you know, we don't know what the reason is. We're trying to get platforms like today to try and spread the word, spread the message. And I, mean, I personally spent, uh, you know, m many a day traveling the country and around the world to try and spread this message. But it appears to us that it's either not getting through or people aren't listening. I don't mean this to be disrespectful, this slide, but that's what it feels like when you're banging your head against the wall and people aren't listening to what we think is a very obvious message. And then really, I think um, coming to the end of the slide presentation here, really in the last few slides, but we think that people are missing the full picture. What we do see, and you know, all credit, we do see a lot of people um, spending a lot of time and money on periphery items, but we think these are only a part of the overall picture. They're small parts of the puzzle. So yes, a real-time system we know is important. Yes, maps and timetables are crucial. Lighting is important, seating is important. Green roofs and solar power, and I put here other gimmicks, you know, they are, they're really gimmicks when you put them in the scheme of the complete, complete lack of investment in the shelter itself. They're all great as individual elements, but we often see a complete uh, miss when it comes to people focusing on the shelter environment. 
And to put that into context, this is a, a very well-known large UK bus operator. We did a quick search on their LinkedIn site to see what staff work there. And this is a list of all the positions and job titles of people within one of these large bus operators. They get it, they understand it. All of these roles are related to marketing and sales because they want to increase patronage. They want to get more bums on seats, as simple as that, but we don't see that same level of input, passion and drive when it comes to the roadside infrastructure. And then lastly, some uh, you know examples of what things could look like. These aren't necessarily designed by ourselves. These are a series of products designed by architects and designers globally. But again, yeah, you can criticise whether it's the right level of comfort, the right level of protection from the rain. But initially, it gives you a completely different profile and picture of the quality of the roadside infrastructure. Same again on the next slide. Very much more modern, very much more in keeping with expectations of today's travelling public. And again, the very last slide is the interchange here at Slough bus station. And again, you know, I defy anybody to say that that's not creating a trans transformational image of bus travel and very much more meeting customer expectations than the vast majority of what was being installed in the streets of the UK today. So that's it. And I think my um, fellow or fellow speakers will um, be adding a bit more flesh on the bones of what I've just said. Thanks very much, Jonathan. That was really fascinating and a pacey run through an awful lot of um, really useful material there that hopefully we can get into a bit more detail on some of it later. I think the thing that really struck me is that, you know, huge gap between the, the low starting point in some places that you demonstrated right at the beginning and mm -hmm. where we want to be. So, um, yeah, good to chat more about that mm -hmm. later. And thank you, Jonathan. Um, you, now I'm going to hand over to our next speaker and we're going to hear from Ivan Bennett. Over to you, Ivan. Thank you, Louise, and thanks, Jonathan, for outlining some of the issues surrounding uh, existing waiting environments. Uh, next slide, please. It's hard to believe I've been supporting the design and development of bus infrastructure for over 30 years. As a furniture and product designer, <clears throat> much of my portfolio has been about improving the experiences of those using a store, station or on the street. The bus stop is more than just a sign. It is a waiting environment for passengers and like rail, they should be provided with a range of amenities, whilst managing the flow of boarding and alighting passengers and other passers-by. Poor waiting and queuing experience can lead to conflict and affect dwell time and even expose people to crime and harm. Irreversible dissatisfaction that discourages people from, re re from returning to the bus. And still they ask, does the bus stop here? Fundamentally, as humans, we are social animals. The designers were social engineers. We have an obligation to challenge convention and deliver ideas for the betterment of society as a whole, whilst attempting to address some of the other environmental impact. Next slide, please. So I invite you to place yourself in the shoes of a passenger on this typically grey overcast chilly February morning, or perhaps you're already struggling with the emotive pull standing momentarily at your front door simultaneously activating your key fob, unlocking your car. So how can we ease the resistance between using a bus and a private car? Time. We're all familiar with the adage, a watch kettle never boils, meaning that time seems to move more slowly when one is anticipating something or waiting for something to occur. So why is the study of time and its perception important in the promotion of bus travel? Consecutive market research over the last 30 years continues to list journey time, waiting time, and the anxiety of missing a service a barrier to use. So despite the fact that 83% of journeys were on time, according to the DFT in 2019, the perceived time interval between two successive events is referred to as perceived duration. Perception can be objectively studied and inferred through a number of scientific experiments, including shorter intervals, tend to be overestimated, while longer intervals tend to be underestimated. Time intervals associated with more changes will be perceived as longer than intervals with fewer changes. In turn, we know that the body temperature affects perception of time, with higher temperatures generally producing faster subjective time and vice versa. This is all exacerbated in periods of arousal or stressful events. So, not surprisingly, this reflects on our attitude towards public transport particularly during these colder, darker months, reinforcing the need to make waiting environments both visually more attractive 
and brighter. And although again, its value is throughout the year for shelters is highly underestimated. Average waiting time in Greater London, according to Ipsos Mori in, in 2014, is nearly seven minutes. And the average journey time is 21 and a half minutes. So what can we do with our time whilst waiting for a bus? Browse the internet, listen to a couple of our favorite tunes, read three pages of a gripping novel, consume half a cup of coffee, or if you still partake, finish a cigarette, although not within the confines of a shelter. So whilst, we, whilst we've established the perception of time is important, what can design do to reduce it? Slide four, please. Professor Yingling Fan of the University of Minnesota research, research in 2015 suggested that whilst the stop quality shouldn't affect time, in the minds of passengers, it seems to do just that. Passengers found that on average, passengers at stops with amenities who waited for 10 minutes perceive the time to 21 minutes. Amenities markedly reduce the perceived time for the same wait to 13 minutes at stops with shelters and seating and to 11 minutes at stops with um, seating and RTI. The study also suggested that the amenities can make travellers feel safer. For women who perceive their surroundings to be unsafe, stop amenities can cut the perceived waiting time by half. Further studies by the uh, University of Utah in 2017 found that stops with shelters and benches patronage grew more than at stops without. The psychological impact of paying attention to the details while designing proper waiting environments is such that it creates a significant shift in customers' perception of waiting time. These seemingly simple features can affect the journey experience to appear to be quicker, regardless of whether there is no reduction of genuine journey time. This implies that it influences the amount of time which individuals are prepared to wait for a particular service. It recommended that it's imperative to provide enhanced waiting environments at stops in addition to a minimum provision of familiar information and signage. Slide five, please. Research by the Australian Transport Assessment and Planning Group identified the value of well-furnished waiting environments being able to reduce perception of time. These graphs illustrate the value of different combination of features. The subsequent updated, they, they subsequently updated their passenger surveys um, last year, reinforced those values for key features at bus and tram stops in New Zealand, New South Wales and in Victoria the second graph illustrating the overall stop ratings, with the final provision of shelter offering the greatest passenger benefit and reduction of perceived waiting time. Auckland Transport's own research went on to identify that this is a point of continued friction in bus travel, with waiting time at the stop twice as frustrating as time spent on the bus. Slide six, please. So elements around waiting are critical to service satisfaction. Delivering a better experience to people waiting for the bus will improve patronage, reducing the widely identified um, frustrations. The DFT, TFL, Transit Centre New York and the University of Minnesota have all recognised that passengers tend to overestimate the amount of time they wait for a service. Significant changes, particularly around, the inform uh, around information with the increase of digitisation of bus information, have provided greater availability and expectation of real-time data. So whilst TfL, JCDCO, Clear Channel, recent, uh, all have done recent research focused around customer behaviours, illustrated extremely high levels of use of personal digital devices, the research still encourages the need for improved waiting environments. Trapeze's recent study for and on behalf of PA Consulting explored how passengers use London's buses. Surprisingly, it's illustrated how information provision should be enhanced. As in London, customers wanted better waiting environments with improved access to information, whilst again, continue to have concerns about perception of journey time. Improving the waiting environment would enable the sector to provide a more substantial platform for enhanced information beyond that of a humble bus stop post. Slide seven. So whilst commercial advertising continues to entertain and visually <coughs> engage customers, narrowing the perception of time, reducing the tedium of tired familiar view, the provision of information remains important to passengers at all stages of the journey. 
Interestingly, while mobile apps perceived, positive, or perceived positively, digital at stop screens remain the highest rated touch point of 57%, greater than on bus audio announcements, where it provides reassurance and the ability to check progress versus expected arrival time. There remains no doubt that the bus stop remains the bus, the, sorry, the shop window to our services. And whilst that should be welcoming and relevant in the entry point to our networks, ultimately a safe environment where live information enables customers to take control of their overall journey. But bus stops can have a broader appeal, meeting the needs of both boarding, alighting and interchanging passengers and passing pedestrians and cyclists, providing physical shelter, local facility mapping, whilst acting as a safe haven for more vulnerable users, particularly at night, when designed well, contribute enormously to the iconography of the city or the vision they serve. Slide eight, please. Back in Auckland, AT's own research in 2013, identified that this is a point of continued friction in bus travel. With waiting at the stop twice as frustrating at time spent on the bus, as we heard earlier. So whilst shelters typically provide protection from the elements, they also protect against noise and can assist in the perception of vulnerability, providing a barrier between the carriageway and even pedestrians. Shelter was the most important and the majority of respondents were prepared to spend more on the quality of shelter and forego a fair reduction. The DFT's own public transport um, statistics in 2007, sorry about Recalled satisfaction with personal safety at the stop were higher where a bus shelter was provided. In all areas, satisfaction with the information given at the bus stop was higher where a shelter was provided at the stop, and higher still where RTI was displayed and in use. So whilst we've made incredible strides to improve operational performance, the roadside waiting environment continues to remain wanting. In summary, whilst urban and metropolitan regional passengers outside London ranked bus stop attributes higher than those in rural areas, rural passengers felt their expectations of the bus stop were not being met, calling for greater provision of shelter. Now, we all know bad design when we see it. But what does good design look like? AT devised this um, evaluation matrix in an attempt to objectively establish good design. After all, good design can build your brand um, into an iconic one communicating via various platforms to make your products and service stand out, whilst in the case of public transport, even contribute towards the, ident the identity of your city and region, creating lasting memories and desire to return. Slide nine, please. So let's attempt to bring this up to date. Why do we continue to ignore the potential of the roadside whiting environment? As Alex Warnby said on this very channel, CEO of Transted Placefield recently, whilst considering the potential of a journey you wanted to make, he said, there is a huge gulf between operators branding and the on street and station experience. Bus back better could provide the catalyst for change, transforming our centers of engaging street furniture we can be proud of, not second rate, lowest cost structures that nobody particularly likes and certainly don't enjoy and they don't remember and they remember for all the wrong reasons. It is, is it any wonder why many don't consider the bus as an option for their expectations to wait in an poorly lit street corner? Meanwhile, here's how the automotive sector is attempting to remain relevant, reinventing the energy retail in the form of um, attractive, <coughs> excuse me, charging hubs <coughs> with all the familiar branding, display amenities and supplementary um, services using mobile tech to improve payment and communication. Let's take this opportunity to design and build genuinely engaging, aspiring and lasting waiting environments and not simply apply some lip gloss to uh, and, and create more um, just, um, lip gloss and create more lasting emotional experiences whilst reducing the negative perception of time with the view that the nicer the setting, the easier the wait. Thank you. Back to Louise. Thanks very much, Ivan. A really interesting presentation there. And um, particularly, I think, interesting to hear about your clear link between the quality of the waiting environment and the, the, the quality of the wait and the length of time that people feel they're waiting for. And that really chimes with our own research that shows that really good quality real time information in particular can make people feel um, 
you know, a higher level of satisfaction with the weight for the bus. So some really interesting stuff in there. Thanks very much, Ivan. Um, so now we go over to our next speaker and we're going to hear from Ed Griffiths. Over to you, Ed. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ed Griffiths. I'm the director of JEDCO Product Design. JEDCO was established in 1984. Uh, we design products for a wide variety of sectors and industries. But in over the last 30 years, we've really specialized in the design of transport infrastructure products. So notable clients have included Transport for London, for example, with the design of the London bus stop in the 1990s. We also helped with the design of the London landmark bus shelter. And we were appointed as the official wayfinding signage designers for the London Olympic Games. But as well as that, we work with uh, transit authorities, transport planners, airports uh, all over the world, the Middle East and North America. Next slide, please. This slide shows a wide variety of the projects that we've been involved in, all in the transport infrastructure space. So wayfinding totems, ticket machines, help points, digital advertising, digital out of home advertising, smart totems, uh, visitor centers. So with all of these designs, the aim is to fulfill the needs of the traveling public and to get more people to use public transport. Next slide, please. So at the start of the presentation, I'd like to show you two images here. These are shelters that weren't designed by us, but hopefully prove a point. So the question for you is, which of these waiting environments would you prefer to use? Which suggests a high quality service? Which suggests the authority values bus customers? And which would you prefer to see on a street near you? If I was to describe these products in words without showing the images, I'd probably say very much the same thing about both. They both have roofs, uh, glazing, seating, metal structures. But I, that I think is where the similarity ends, certainly in terms of the experience that you might uh, receive when you used one of these products. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Again, we've got two further examples here. Um, interestingly, they are both in Scotland. The one on the left is in Edinburgh. The one in the right is in Dundee. And again, which one would you prefer to use? I think there's quite a difference between these two products, even though they fulfill the same purpose. One would attract you to use the service and one would probably discourage you from using the service. Next slide, please. We believe that to deliver modal shift, customers need to be attracted to use the bus service. But the reality is that customers have a choice, especially new customers who aren't familiar with the service. They can drive, use the train, taxi, Uber, walk or cycle. And the reality is that bus services compete with these other modes. When making a choice about which uh, mode of transport to use, customers instinctively compare the experience and that's what helps them to make their choice. Next slide, please. These images show uh, environments in rail, hospitality and retail sectors. These companies know that their customers have a choice. So they invest in their environments to create great customer experiences. And this is what attracts people to use their service instead of someone else's service, and then hopefully to remain loyal to them. Next slide, please. Therefore, customer experience is key to helping new customers to use the bus. But the customer experience doesn't begin on the bus, it starts with the waiting environment. You usually have a shelter at the beginning of the journey and at the end of the journey. Poor quality experience here will deter potential customers. A high quality experience will encourage potential customers. Next slide, please. In the next few slides, I'm going to explain in practical terms how the experience of the waiting environment can be improved. The first thing is the first impression you get. These are examples by other designers around the world showing what they're thinking about. These products, will, I believe, have a wow factor that will grab the attention of the public, especially those who aren't familiar with the service. This will promote awareness and encourage them to think about using the services. Modern designed infrastructure like this suggests a modern, effective service. In contrast, a poor, old-fashioned tire designs suggest a tired, old service and discourage use. These types of products reflect well on the transit authorities uh, that install them, and it shows to the public that these authorities care about them. Next, next slide, please. 
bespoke designs. So what is a bespoke design? A bespoke design is something that is created for, especially for a place, for a group of traveling public, and for an authority. These are examples from around the world that show very specific designs created for specific places. Locally sensitive design can create a sense of place, belonging and ownership for the people that live there. These can be a highly visible way for an authority to show that it's investing in its community. These products will also last for decades and advertise the service for decades. They're not a flash in the pan thing, they'll be there for a long time. Next slide, please. Materials are a very important part of understanding the value of a product. Whenever you touch, feel or see a material, it gives you an impression, either good or bad. If you think about a new restaurant that might open on your street, if you look through the window and it has nice leather seats, lovely wooden benches, nice lighting, nice tiled floors, you will get an impression of quality and that will help you to consider and use that for the service of that restaurant. The same can apply to the bus shelter environment. Quality materials can give a sense of value and this can be immediately felt by customers. Additionally, with the right material choices, we can create durable structures that look better for longer and can reduce ongoing maintenance, providing long-term cost saving. In contrast, poor material choices can lead to corrosion and vandalism, which can create unattractive environments that people simply don't want to spend time at. Next slide, please. Next point is with regard to lighting. Lighting is obviously very important for making people feel safe, especially at night or in the dark winter mornings. In the top middle, I show two images of uh, examples in the UK, pretty typical examples, where we have a rather cold uh, use of lighting, creates a gloomy, and unwelcoming and unattractive environment. The same lighting components can be used and designed and applied differently as shown in the other images. Warmer lighting can be used and it can be arranged in better ways. This can attract customers, make them feel comfortable and reassured. Next slide, please. The seating that you will typically encounter at most bus shelters is among the most uncomfortable that you would sit on in your daily life. But it doesn't have to be this way. In other outdoor spaces and in retail, hospitality, you will encounter far better designed furniture. Often the seating at bus shelters will be made of metal, quite cold in the winter, perhaps too hot in the summer, and not very ergonomically designed. It doesn't fit your body, it doesn't feel nice to sit on. With the average dwell time at a shelter being six minutes, we believe that better seating will encourage customers to dwell at shelters and use the service more often. Next slide, please. The penultimate point is with regards to sustainability. The bus service is already one of the most sustainable modes of transport. However, we think a lot more can be done. We sometimes see solar panels and living roofs being applied. But again, much more can be done with the actual materials that are used to construct bus shelters. There are a lot of new materials coming online now. We can use recycled plastics, other recycled materials. We can use plant-based materials, generally materials that have a lower, le lower levels of embodied carbon and energy. But this, we believe, can help authorities to meet sustainability targets. Obviously, the use of sustainable materials is a, a good advertising proposition as well as the general public are very interested in reducing uh, the effects of climate change. Last slide, please. So in conclusion, we believe that design thinking at the early stage of specifying new infrastructure can deliver dramatically improved customer experiences. This is well established and proven to work in other sectors, rail, aviation, hospitality. They've been doing this for many, many years. If we apply this type of thinking more often to the bus sector, and in particularly to the waiting environment, it can attract new customers, act as an advertisement for the service, build customer loyalty, and we believe drive modal shift. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ed. Another eye-opening presentation there. Um, 
and again, a thing that really jumped out to me was that that kind of link between um, good quality facilities, treating people like valued customers, offering them the wow factor. And it, it really chimes again with Transport Focus's research that shows that treating your bus passengers like valued customers is a fantastic way to increase their level of trust in the company and build a relationship with them. Um, really interesting. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so now we're going to hear from our final speaker. Um, it's over to Claire. Thank you very much, Louise, and good morning, everyone. Yes, I've really enjoyed the presentations. Um, it's, and I completely agree with the previous speakers that making much more of the bus's shop window um, will make a pretty significant difference in encouraging more modal switch. Um, first impressions absolutely count. So I, I also really welcome this webinar for putting a spotlight on the the, the simple fact that really good quality roadside bus infrastructure has been much neglected. Um, it's not actually something that I've even thought about much. I thought a lot about buses, but it really has been neglected. And, it's, and seeing the slides and seeing those amazing images, uh, it, wow, that's the world we want to live in. You know, that, that looks really good. Um, but, you know, that historically there has been a, a, really, a real lack of investment. Um, and I believe um, that this lack of investment in good quality, really high quality roadside bus infrastructure is a symptom of a much wider malaise. Um, in fact, it's, in my view, it's part of a broader culture of insufficient focus um, on demand side measures um, to decarbonise transport. And, and ultimately, um, it, it, it really speaks to a still predominantly car dominated based transport system. Um, so anyway, I've been asked to contribute a few reflections, really. Um, on really, really, I suppose why it matters from a societal perspective um, that we improve roadside bus infrastructure. So just a couple of quick words about Greener Transport Solutions. So Green, Greener Transport Solutions is a not-for-profit organisation dedicated to the decarbonisation of transport. Um, we receive grant funding from the Foundation for Integrated Transport and our work is overseen by uh, the Greener Transport Council of leading academics, academics and experts from across the sector. Um, transport is the biggest polluting sector of the UK economy and, and really very little progress has been made on decarbonising transport um, since 1990. Um, and what we've seen is that vehicle efficiency gains have been continually eroded by the trend to larger vehicles and rising demand for car and van travel. Um, and the key conclusion of our manifesto, the, the manifesto of the Greener Transport Council, which oversees our work, the key conclusion was that is, is that whilst we support the government's transport decarbonisation plan in its world leading targets to phase out all new polluting road vehicles by 2040, that's great, um, urgent attention needs to be given to reducing the volume of traffic on our roads if we're going to stay in line, we're going to hit net zero. Um, and we urgently need focus at national level on delivering behaviour change. So, I mean, I think, look, aside from his current difficulties, I think it is fair to say that for the first time, we do in fact have a Prime Minister who um, gets buses um, and the importance of modal switch. And I suggest he, he might um, think back somewhat wistfully to the days when gossip columnists were more concerned uh, or more interested in uh, his penchant for making buses out of wine crates. But be that as it may, um, I think it, it, it has to be said, it's, this government has consistently been clear um, that it wants to reverse the historic uh, lack of investment in, in, bus, in buses, and that must be reversed. And we, we've seen you know, the local, uh, the um, levelling up white paper that came out just last week. Um, local transport is features very prominently, it's one of the 12 key goals. Um, the Transport Decarbonisation Plan makes clear its aim for public transport, walking and cycling to be the natural first choice. Um, and Bus Back Better was absolutely touted as the dawn of a new age for bus investment. And however, I think you might have heard the however coming, we, we might wonder perhaps if the wheels are coming off a little bit at the moment. Local transport authorities have now been informed that um, the promised three billion of funding over the next three years is going to shrink to 1.4 billion, um, you know, funding for the bus service investment improvement plans is falling way short. I mean, the analysis for, um, by the shadow buses minister suggests that funding required, um, the, you know, the funding required for the bids already in 
exceeds 7 billion and when all are in it's likely to be 9 billion so it's 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 going to fall way short and meanwhile meanwhile the bus industry is warning that up to 30 percent of services um, are at risk of ending when emergency government financial support ceases in april i mean you know that, that these are these are tough times um it also needs to be noted that conspicuously absent um, from the transport decarbonisation plan was any real consideration of road pricing. Um, we applaud the Transport Select Committee for taking up the mantle, um, and you know, it, which is putting a spotlight on the need for, for road pricing. Um, but the debate is currently framed around the need for the Treasury to replace fuel duty with, um, you know, with something else you know, to, to avoid the impending. Um, fiscal hole, back hole of 35 billion, um, rather than what we really ought to be seeing, which is a proper consideration of how we can price transport to fully account for external costs. Um, that politically makes sense to go down that route, um, but it's clear a clear indication of just how far away the public are from where we need them to be on this crucial issue. I mean, it's, it's another, an honest conversation is really urgently needed. And modal switch needs to be front and centre. Um, the improvement of public transport is key, just is both to levelling up and to achieving net zero. It's, it's, it's fundamental. I mean, buses matter. In my previous role, um, I headed up the Sustainable Transport Group, Greener Journeys. And over a number of years, we built up a powerful evidence base um, on the wider value of the bus. And, you know, it's... Despite the battering that buses have received through the pandemic, you know, the basics still hold. Buses provide crucial access to employment, education, and essential services. A 10% improvement in bus service connectivity is associated with a 3.6% reduction in social deprivation. And actually a 10% reduction in bus journey times um, would, would mean 50,000 more people in work. And new developments in urban centres well connected by public transport can stimulate 50% more economic growth than equivalent developments on the fringe. Um, whilst, you know, of course, a double decker bus could take 75 cars off the road and, and I could go on. I mean, what we've what we found through our research over the years is that expenditure on bus capital projects is particularly um, delivers particularly good returns. Um, analysis by KPMG for Greener Journeys showed that. Um, typically, bus capital schemes would generate £4.90 for every £1 invested. Um, and in, in further research commissioned by Greener Journeys and the Department of Transport, um, KPMG concluded that spending, that, you know, depending on levels of recovery from COVID, on average, spending to boost on boosting bus services outside of London should, should go about 60 to 70 percent on infrastructure and 30 to 40% on supporting fares and additional services. Of course, this very much depends on, on recovery levels from the pandemic. And you know, the, the disbenefits of where we are, of our, of our current transport system are painfully obvious. I mean, we, in addition to stubbornly high carbon emissions, um, we, you know, we, 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 str we struggle with congestion, air pollution, um, social exclusion, and of course, you know, obesity, loneliness epidemics, where a third of people have deliberately caught the bus to have some human contact. But, you know, it's, it, buses matter. So, wrapping up, really, we're, we're nowhere near where we need to be, in my view. Um, on the biggest issue of our times, we are in Last Chance Saloon. Um, the IPCC report was um, code red for humanity. COP26 was a partial success in that it's kept the goal of 1.5 degrees alive, but the world needs to go so much further and transport is the fastest growing source of global greenhouse gas emissions. We won't succeed if we persist with greening business as usual, if we persist with the illusion that we can rely on technology and actually, you know, in, in, and in fact, we've got to not only re realise that we can't rely on technology and then how, how the hell we sell that to the general public. To achieve our 2030 target will require a reduction in car kilometres of around a quarter. The Mayor of London has committed to 27%. Scotland has committed to 20%. That's the kind of leadership that we need from central government. We need, you know, but, but you know, to deliver that kind of 
demand reduction is going to require more than just a few nudges. People need to understand why it matters, why they need to change how they travel and how they can make a difference. We need to improve public transport and that includes getting the infrastructure planning and pricing right. But more fundamentally, our whole economy needs to change. We need to reduce the need for travel. We need to move to a more circular economy and to question fundamental assumptions about our continuing reliance on GDP growth. This will be a battle of hearts and minds and it's going to require a level of engagement with the public that is just currently missing. You know, what does life beyond fossil fuels look like? How can we live a better life? And, you know, we, of course we can live a better life. We have to, and we have to make that message, say that loudly and clearly. No one wants their children's lungs to be damaged by air pollution or for the continuing corrosive impact of, of car dependency on society, or for hours of lives and productivity to be lost to congestion. How can we begin to reimagine our daily lives? So as we begin the task of envisaging a better world, I would now like to turn our minds back to the inspiring images that we've seen um, in, in, in this webinar about what good quality roadside bus infrastructure should look like. And I would suggest what better invitation to the traveling public to choose public transport instead of the car. I mean, this is the shift in mindset that we need to bring about, and I can't really think of a better place to start. Thank you. Thanks, Claire, exactly right. And a really thought provoking reminder there of the importance of the bus to society as a whole and some of the wider issues. Um, so thanks very much, Claire. And I'd like to invite all the rest of the panelists back to turn your cameras on and, and join us now for a question session. just Jonathan yes there we are we're all here okay great um we've had lots of questions coming in from the audience um and you won't be surprised to know that there are a few on the big subject of funding and that's the one that I'm going to start with because I think here we're all agreed that fantastic roadside infrastructure is where we want to be there's a, a big gap and, and that's where we want to get to but how do we get there when local authorities are strapped for cash and for some in England national bus strategy funding might offer some help but it's not going to be the answer to all the problems. Um, I'm going to come to you first Jonathan, you actually touched on some alternative streams of funding um, previously so interested in whether you've got some some more thoughts on that and, and how local authorities can apply for some additional funding. Yeah, um, okay, uh, Louise. Well, basically, in terms of a response to that, um, obviously, it's a question we get asked um, time and time again, and it obviously is a serious issue. I think one of the things I would say is, in terms of uh, people need to recognise that they need they need the funds for this purpose. I think that's the first thing. People need to understand how the money can be spent and put to good use. So, for example, the Bus Back Better document, you know, had there been more of an emphasis in there on the importance of the right side infrastructure, understanding obviously that Claire succinctly puts that, you know, the there's a significant um, underfund there uh, with what is required and what would be available. I think people are more likely to um, put the waiting environment or changes to the waiting environment as part of their bus service improvement plan. So they will, they would be um able to get a proportion of that money that's available would be spent on the infrastructure um in addition to that however um and again sorry I, well, I would say just to add to that um in terms of um making people aware whether it's government and all the other bodies were aware of the importance of the infrastructure will again have the effect of we believe and we've, we've been doing this a very long time uh, creating more awareness and effectively uh, funding potentially will become more available once people realise what a good return on investment the roadside infrastructure actually is. And I think a lot of authorities have actually noticed and done their own research that the investment in the bus shelter is the, is the, well, the, the highest, the highest investment they can make in terms of return on investment for the fare box. Uh, and in terms of um, other forms of funding you mentioned, yes, I mean in our experience we're involved in all sorts of other mobility, and we do see significant sums of money being spent in other areas of mobility. We still see it, whether it's active travel, um, um, whether it's uh, clean air funding, uh, all, all sorts of different funds are available that are within the same sphere as 
mobility, public transportation, clean air funding, carbon reduction funds, that sort of thing. In our experience, we've seen them used innovatively by selected authorities, selected cities towards bus infrastructure. And I think that one thing we would say, if I could wind the clock back 10 or 15 years ago, the bus infrastructure uh, role it, um, used to be a specific role within a city, within an authority. We've seen that very much diluted now, and you've got you know more people that are involved in the, the wider sphere of mobility, hence their attention. And I think the funding now is spread uh, more thinly amongst all the other forms. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. I can see a few other people nodding. Does anyone else want to come in on that same question? It's a big topic, and I'm sure there's plenty to say. I mean, there's, there's huge challenges about local, local authorities, <clears throat> um, but people aren't uh, necessarily joining things up. Is that? Um, I, I indicated that the bus shelter or the bus stops generally in waiting environments can be used by others. Um, so it's not just boarding, alighting, interchanging, but the pedestrian. Um, and if you go back to the 1930s when London Transport start, started designing purposefully pub, uh, public passenger shelters, um, they, they had a social bent towards them. You know, they often had seating on the reverse side facing a green open space or recreation ground or um, um, a park and they would even uh, enable the panels to be used by the local community to advertise you know, local events and such like. We're not, we're not using the shelter in its broadest possible sense. Um, in London we've now seen this loss but we used we had a huge program through the legible London program of walking and walkability, making our cities more legible. And every bus stop, all eighteen thousand of them, had a local vicinity map within the bus stop. That wasn't just to appease the need of the bus passenger. That also served to to enable people to walk and explore their local communities more. So that was you know, every four hundred meters across London, there was an individual map. It was unique. There was there, these were stop specific artworks. They've gone. In most cases, they've gone. There's a handful left. We're we're, we're not joining this up. Even the, the when we introduced naming in London 30 years ago, it actually helped pedestrians move around more because every 400 meters there was another name. You know, normally the local side road or whatever, but it 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 it, it made our cities more legible. Um. We, we introduced the towards plate on, on, the, on the bus stop sign. That, that as, as a cyclist, I, I don't drive, but as a cyclist, I often use towards information on the bus stop posts to help me navigate areas which I'm not so familiar with. Why are we not using the bus stop and the shelter in the broadest possible manner to reach out to cyclists and walkers in the community? That it's not just the sole provision of the bus passenger. Um, we, we are missing huge opportunities with, 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 with these pieces of street furniture. Um, so funding we know is hugely challenging. I mean, most local authorities, what, 60% of their funding, uh, their, their budget is going on to social care? Well, we know that walking and getting the bus is a much healthier way for us all. Wouldn't that be uh, enlightening to, to see uh, some of that you know, money going into that as well? Thanks, Ivan. And just um, just while we're still talking about this kind of sense of place and local community, Ed, you talked about this. You talked about that kind of community sense of design and so on. Is there a role to do something in bus, which we have started to see in rail, I think, quite a bit, where some stations are really being used as community hubs and to offer these really great alternatives? So it could more be done at some stop stations interchanges, Ed? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the waiting environment can be used by other people. Um, it's not, not not necessarily just for the bus users. It can be a local amenity with other features there, um, wayfinding, um, other types of amenity, phone charging, Wi-Fi, the aspects that can be added to create a much uh, rounder, rounded experience. Uh, not just a roof over your head and a seat, but something that the wider public can use. And that will also then encourage people to use the bus services if they're attracted to the the waiting environment for other reasons they may then also consider taking the bus more often so i think there is a lot that can be done there absolutely thanks and claire i wonder if you want to come in on that yes uh, your I just had a point just to make one a wider point on funding and um 
really we've got the price signals wrong. Um, so public transport is getting more expensive relative to relative to the driving the car. So you know that's the kind of the big picture is it's it's getting cheaper to drive versus compared to use public transport. Um, I touched briefly in my intro remark, remarks on road pricing. Now, you know, and mentioned, of course, at the moment, all we're looking with all that's being discussed at the moment is replacing the black hole, the fiscal black hole when fuel duty dries up with all the fleet go electric. But, you know, if we were to price properly, you know, what about um, road, road pricing, fund or revenue from but pricing properly to use our roads, um, being funding really good high quality public transport infrastructure. I mean, that's the sort of thing. I mean, the Trojan Hayes hypothecation and, 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 all, and how it's done, but, but really the, the way we need to be thinking is, is how can we finance, you know, through the, the, the modes that are kind of less sustainable, um, through pricing properly for those, how can we finance um, really good infrastructure? Because obviously public funding is, is shrinking. It's a, it's a battle and the, there's huge pressures on finances. So we have to think, Innovatively, of course, the difficulty with all of that is is how we begin that conversation with the public, because you know can't appear to be anti-motorist, but but it's not. It's actually pro local transport. It's it, it's positioning this in a way that isn't going to alienate. Um, it's just the wider point. I think whenever we talk about funding, I think we've just got to not ignore the elephant in the room, which is the competition is the car, <laughs> you know, and it's getting cheaper to drive compared to use public transport. And even sorry, even worse. As the fleet electrifies, the running costs will go right down because, you know, you, essentially, if, if we don't replace fuel duty in BD, you're buying an electric car, you've got really low running costs, you're just building in the fact you're going to drive way more. So it's, it's actually potentially going to get worse. That's where we actually are. Um, so that's that's the that's what we need to change. It's a big it's a big ask. No, exactly right. And I think, um, you know, that point about as we move to EV and, and uh, the conversation about how we pay for our road use is going to become more and more important. And you're absolutely right that it's about starting those conversations, isn't it? And approaching them in a way that isn't going to immediately kind of turn people off and how we get into it and get some constructive conversations. Um, and an interesting idea on the same point made by one of our audience members. Um, about funding was maybe a mechanism for local authorities to benefit from customer growth potentially through some sort of revenue sharing mechanism so um, these types of ideas a bit beyond our traditional thoughts of funding are probably where we need to go um, so thanks for your comments on that I'm going to move on to talk about a completely different element um, let's talk about cycle infrastructure <laughs> we have had um, a few yeah. questions from different people Peter Monk and Greg Morgan among others um, talking about that relationship and often conflict between cycle infrastructure and bus stops. So um, I just wonder um, if there's some thoughts on kind of how we allocate that road space and how we smooth out those, you know, difficult relationships to make sure that our road users, be they, you know, the bus, the bus passenger, the cyclist, are getting a fair share there. Anyone got a, got a view on that and want to chip in? I think that's you, Ivan, I would say. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, it's, we're, we're never going to find um, that that, um, that silver bullet, um, partic particularly in the UK. Our, our, our road networks are medieval; uh, they're too narrow, and um, you, we can't please everybody all of the time. <clears throat> um, but there are some glaringly bad uh, cycle schemes going in. I, I, I am a, you know, I don't drive. I've cycled all my adult life. Um, and there are cycle, I live in southwest London, there are cycle uh, facilities here I will not use. I mean, they're, they're just blatant, they're just dangerous. They're, they're, they're compromising the whole, the whole, we're meant to be encouraging cycling and, and bus use, and we're compromising safe, adequate use of bus stops by, by, by some of these local schemes. TfL have done in, enormous amounts of design research on this over the last two decades, and people still ignore what TfL's own design guidelines. Uh, but it's not just TfL, you know, the, the, the Dutch, the Danes, uh, NTA in Ireland, and uh, in, uh, AT in, in uh, Auckland Transport in New Zealand, got some really great design advice for cycling and cycle, uh, the, the amalgamation of cycling and bus. But we're still seeing you know, really disconnected uh, 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 schemes being built. I'm not answering Peter's question, but um, we 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 need to separate it, particularly if we're going to make them attractive. 
So by, bypasses um, absolutely essential where we can fit them in. And sadly, you know, a lot of streets here in the UK are just really not adequate. But it doesn't mean to say it can't be managed. But don't start doing these half-hearted schemes. It's really disappointing for everybody concerned. Um, yeah, I, I much prefer the island scheme with a clear bypass behind them with a, a level pedestrian access um, going to and from the bus stop on island. Um, I know that uh, Trueform have been involved in some over the last two years with COVID. Uh, some of those were, were originally temporary, but they're now being made full time. Um, and you know, it, it can be done, um, we, but it won't be one answer for, for all situations. No, and it's about planning it, isn't it? It's the design yeah. of the whole thing rather than kind of shoving bits in afterwards that then don't work with each other. Well, um, I was also disappointed, sorry, there was, that we, we lost a lot of bus priority in London. Well, and, and other cities, Liverpool's lost a lot of pri bus priority. Um, I, I suppose it's all about confidence, isn't it? As a cyclist, I don't mind using a bus lane because actually in London, I'm spoiled, aren't I? Um, but in London, CFL have done a lot of work about training drivers. So the awareness level now amongst the, the drivers, drivers is, is really high. And, the, and, I, and we wave to one another and, you know, and we, we give way to one another. That came about through an educational program. Now maybe we've got to see more educational programs going on uh, across the UK to ensure that bus drivers know how to behave with cyclists and be aware of them. But we're also seeing better quality um, uh, onboard cameras being used. Um, so I'm personally, I'm not sticking my neck out here, but I'm not averse to cycles being in bus lanes. Um, uh, I know that doesn't satisfy everybody's needs, but once you gain, it's about confidence. Uh, at least I'm not in the mainstream traffic. Um, I'm in a dedicated lane for bus, taxi and cycles, and I feel reasonably safe. Okay, thanks Ivan. Claire? Yeah, I just wanted to make the general point, I understand the question, and it's an important one because road space is a highly contested resource, fiercely contested, and you know, it's trade-offs, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the general point that I want to make, I think it's really important, which is that, that all the sustainable modes need to work together to reduce, you know, particularly single occupancy cars, but to reduce car travel, you know, to reduce, to, to uh, and, and so, you know, it sometimes, and, and again, the other point to, to assist in that, local transport needs to be planned in, in kind of, in in sync really with the with local local economic plans you know what do we actually need what are, that's the sort of planning that will then re, will mean that the right kind of infrastructure is prioritized at the right you know for the right sort of um amenity or whatever but but i think i just without really getting into the detail into, into contentious areas i just want to make the really important general point which is we have to avoid wars between the modes because the sustainable transfer modes you know they have they're in its for the longer they have to be in it together um, to kind of because everybody needs to we, we just need to make it impossible we need to make it possible um, to not have to read for the car piece and we've seen those wars happen with the best will in the world and the, you know kind of the intentional starting point and then you know they're very counterproductive aren't they in the long run yeah. um, I'm going to move on to a question from Paul Horn and he's asked about the you know he's made the point that everyone's keen to provide excellent roadside infrastructure but that there are challenges about antisocial behaviour and maintaining that in the long run the impact on customer perception of bus travel so what are the recommendations in terms of design and maintenance to try and minimise antisocial behaviour and Jonathan I'm going to come to you on that one yeah okay Louise well I think that to answer that one in our experience um, if you provide quality roadside infrastructure that's that's well maintained so the maintenance is kept up to date found that, that the level of um, of ongoing or repeat uh, vandalism, destruction and damage to the shelter is significantly reduced. And um, people might find that hard to believe, but in our experience over many, many, many years, and I'm sure Ivan at TfL, it was the same, if you provide an environment, people tend to respect it. You'll always get the exceptions, but as a general rule, um, you know, if there's a shelter that's been damaged or there's graffiti on it that's not replaced in a prompt fashion, it will sustain further attacks and get worse and worse and worse. If you, uh, So that's the first point I would say, is that just because 
something's vandalized doesn't mean to say that it shouldn't get repaired if you repair it it will in our experience last longer and the other thing is it comes down to choices of materials and design um we 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 design products that a um in terms of the way it's perceived it has a perceived rust robustness as well as a physical robustness if people think it's it's very robust um, more often than not in our experience they may not vandalize it or they they tend not to vandalize it if it's looked at as an easy target they will they will try and vandalize it you know or in some instances it will be vandalized so it, there's a two-pronged attack really it's um you know if you were to put something out there and expect not to maintain it then yes it will degrade and very soon end up looking uh, quite the opposite to what the original um, um image was of the product but i think you know with any new infrastructure you need to provide a sensible um maintenance uh, regime and structure that goes with it and that in our experience again will keep the product looking good for a very very long period of time and also material choice of materials i mean ed touched upon it you know um and i talked about it in the beginning of my slides is that there is an emphasis at the moment to buy the cheapest install the cheapest complete disregard for what's what's the best product in terms of long-term investment i'm not talking about its attraction or draw with the public i'm talking about you know will it still be looking in reasonable condition in five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve years time and we, we provided some products um, to various places around the world and they've spent more initially on the materials and the finishes and they look as good today as they did when they were installed i mean the stuff we provided in las vegas for example we put those first put those in the ground probably 10 to 15 years ago you know recent um site visits there by some of our staff in america they look exactly the same today as they did 15 years ago you know they're, they're obviously 15 years old but they've been so well um, looked after and mainly because of the right choice of materials and finishes they you know the actual a level of maintenance they require is very low anyway <clears throat> Thanks, Jonathan. And um, I think that takes us on really nicely to talk about a next point, actually, about the provision of information at bus stops. And I'm not really talking here just about um, that kind of one-off installation of good quality real-time information, but actually how do authorities with limited budgets make sure that what they're buying is going to stand the test of time? We've had a couple of questions in, one from uh, Mia Antonio about the relationship between sort of developing tech and bus stops and the way that works together in a way that's sustainable and within lifespan. And we're often seeing the case, aren't we, of by the time technology is installed at bus stops, it, it's almost life expired in a lot of cases. How does it keep pace? And what about the lack of poorer IT in, in rural areas and the difficulties there of providing real-time information? So I wonder um, who wants to take that one? Ed, is that something that you would like to come in on? Yeah, I mean, I think it's obviously very important to to have these technologies <clears throat> when we can. But I think um, if it, if I, I'd like to step back a little bit and say that these sorts of technologies are only used by people when they are actually have decided to use the waiting environment. So before that point, you have to create an attractive environment that gets them into the bus shelter, gets them thinking about using the bus, and then these technologies can come into play. So I think, first of all, it's part of a package, really, of having the right physical infrastructure with the technology to support it. But you're absolutely right, technology does change and it does develop and it can be hard to predict. Um, it, it's a difficult subject and there's obviously lots of different technologies out there. Um, Future-proofing needs to be considered at the design stage and the specification stage, that's vital. Um, difficult, though, as, as technologies do change. Um, quite rapidly. Um, the, the other thing I would say is that information can be, if used correctly, uh, an advertisement for the service. So when it's inside the, the shelter, it's appealing to those that have already decided to wait there, but it can be used more as an advertisement, so facing outwards, for example, more of a local amenity, um, and that, that will increase its benefit to the, the, not just the, those using the, the service, um, but to the wider public in that locality as well. Thanks, Ed. And I wonder, is there a kind of wider question on this, Claire, about the type of information on offer at, at bus stops and integration with other modes, understanding kind of the whole network generally? And um, we talked previously, but again, about the role in the community. I think it almost links back to that. 
Um, certainly just thinking back now to my days when I was more involved in bus in when I was greener journeys. Um, I remember we did some research on what were the switch factors to how could you persuade car users to switch to to public transport. Um, and information was one of the key. I mean, obviously, <laughs> I mean, it, it's it, it was up there. I mean, I think that the, the, the biggest switch factor was, in fact, uh, speed and convenience. Um, but information and ticketing um, were closely, closely followed on. Um, so that would be my observation, really, that it's, it's, it is a really important factor to get people to switch and getting it right, reassuring people, you know, that, it, that that's what I would say to that. I yeah, think, I think exactly it's one, right. one thing on there, Louise, it, it touched on it, is the word future-proof. So what we try and do with our products with clients is make sure that the actual structure itself is future-proofed. And that's, you know, we, we, we ensure that we have a good handle on available technologies now, but also a forward look into what uh, technologies uh, are in their embryonic form that may be available in the future. So, I mean, we know this Ivan and Ed, I mean, many of the projects that we've worked on perhaps together, they've always been, that's been a prerequisite, is making sure that there's adequate provision. The foundations have been laid within the product design in the early stages, such that if a product was to be introduced at a later date, even if additional funding became available, that can be added on to the product um, and doesn't look like an afterthought. And I think that's one of the things I would say is um, many people may buy a particular piece of technology to put on a bus stop or shelter. Um, again, and in my experience, unfortunately, they sometimes do it to fulfill a particular requirement. You know, we've we've you know, we've done one or two of these in the city. We can forget about that now because you know, look, look, look what a good job we've done. But a lot of these things are only effective if it's done, um, you know, network wide um, and in, in conjunction with other forms of mobility. So there's a joined up level of information. But I think future proofing at the early design stage is the key thing from our our perspective. Yeah, I think a good example was the London bus stop that we worked on in the 90s, where the original brief wasn't to have digital displays or solar power or lighting. But we sort of knew that these things might be coming around the corner, even though they weren't, those technologies weren't perhaps as advanced as they they needed to be at the time. So, for example, we designed it so that it had space for batteries, that there would be a way to fit a panel, a solar panel to the top, that, that lighting could be integrated somewhere that it was easy to remove the timetable and replace it with uh, an illuminated timetable. Um, so thinking about a design in a sort of modular sense where pieces can be easily swapped out and interchangeable doesn't mean that you have to take away the whole shelter or bus stop if, you, if the technology changes. So that, that design thinking about modularity, giving that future flexibility, even though you can't predict what the technology might be, is important. Uh, and then what happened with that particular bus stop project is that Ten years later, the solar panel technology had moved on, and we were able to then retrofit a very large number of the stops relatively easily because we considered how you could do that in future at the at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah when that when that design brief was originally um, issued, it was um, bus stop of the future. Um, so as designers, we were given that what it what it might look like during the duration of its life, which was which was predicted to be twenty five years. So actually, a lot of some of those stops now are now older than the original um, project predicted life. Um, but we we saw foresaw an evolution of the features on that bus stop. So we knew that we weren't going to do digital immediately. Um, it was just just beyond us. But we also knew it was going to mature. So we made sure that the sign system, whilst it was perceived to be a little bit more expensive, could be adapted readily during its life. And what's really frustrating for me, and I started off when I spoke, was after 30 years of doing this, is like we haven't moved on. Yeah, you know, there's no next generation of bus stop and shelter being done. Well, there are a few, but they're not having that same the, the same opportunities to to look towards the future about and and carry their their the businesses forward. We can't afford it all at once, but don't keep putting in these agricultural shelters and they literally are they're on the verge of being agricultural the stainless steel or galvanized steel very often why because it's it's relatively cheap it's easy to maintain it's hard and you know robust but you're sending out really mixed messages and we, we can get rid of all the glazing get rid of your glazing smash blazing problem right let's have um, um steel steel shutters instead but that sends out such a negative attitude and an idea about what 
yeah, we value you so much, we're going to shield you in steel because you know, we're giving you a prison mentality. That doesn't solve the problem. That just, in fact, it almost, it's a red rag to a bull, it just antagonizes them to have another hard go at something to destroy it. We've got to make these things that they actually resonate with our communities and they want them and they actually protect them and value them. That's the way it has been in our distant past. We just completely undervalue it today. And it's such a shame. Thanks, Ivan. I think, yes, that's back to Jonathan's similar point earlier about people looking after the better quality infrastructure. Um, can I ask a question now about different kind of sizes and levels of facilities that are needed? We've had a couple of questions in from the audience, one from Alex Hurd and also one here from Madeleine Stonehill, who specifically says, do you see a different level of standard for bus infrastructure that needs to be applied depending on the location and how many passengers are using it? And I think that's a really important one to address if we can. Ivan, nodding yeah, enthusiastically. Um, yeah, you, um, yeah, the, the, again, there's no one product fits all. Uh, quite, quite, you know, in the rural location, you might have one passenger an hour. Um, whereas in, um, uh, say, Kingston Town Centre, we know that throughout the course of the day, there'd be some in excess of 24,000 uh, bus users uh, within the town centre itself. Um, so, yeah, there's no one to one solution. What we need to do as designers is make sure we're offering a range of street furniture parts that, that meet, as a business, meet those needs and can scale up, you know, they're modular and can be scaled accordingly to, to the local specific needs. So I noticed there was a question last night about, you know, how many do shelters, uh, are, can they accommodate all the people? Um, well, probably the answer is probably no, in an idea, uh, but we can't take ownership of the complete street, that would be ridiculous. But um, we need to have modular structures. And again, we're not, we're not making that investment. We're building these solitary, barest minimum structures you can't then t rock up another five years time and add another extension to it yeah you committed to this really rigid frame we the, the three of us have designed systems where we can add multiples to it or if need be if the, if the routing changes we can subtract pieces without a huge upheaval and costs associated with it mm. Thanks, i Ivan. think that's a Jonathan? good yeah, I was going to say that. In, I mean, just an example of one where, you know, we, uh, uh, Ivan's right. It's designing modular products, and I think it's key that, for example, taking Dundee. So we manufactured and installed seventeen very large uh, shelters within the city centre of Dundee. But then there were a further, I think it was three hundred and sixty-three smaller shelters in, in the sort of when you sort of spanned out of the centre of Dundee but the thing was they all looked very similar they were part of a suite of furniture a family resemblance between the larger shelters and the small shelters there was that engagement with the public they knew it was part of the same service it that they were joined up in terms of the visual imagery and I think um, if you look at Dundee we didn't mention any of the figures uh, did, did we Ed but I think that there was um, you know, when Dundee did that work, yes, it was, it was very expensive. They, they employed a very good architect to do the work. They knew what they were doing. It created a, this, this, this fantastic um, suite of furniture. And um, that was in conjunction with other uh, things going on at the same time at the stop. So real time was installed, better mapping. Uh, there was the, the pavement widening that took place, but they, they demonstrated a 6% year on year increase in bus ridership as a result of that work. Now, it's not all associated with just the bus shelves. So as I said, there was other associated things, the pavements are widened, but that at-stop waiting environment created a 6% year-on-year increase in bus ridership. And I remember going there before we did the work and it was absolutely congested round the block with taxis. Everyone, you know, the taxi, 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 taxi. We put these in, this infrastructure in place and then it completely transformed people's perceptions of bus travel. And that's the thing, it's it's getting that transformational change. Fascinating. Thanks, Jonathan. And we're almost out of time, but I wouldn't like to end this webinar without a quick comment on how we meet the needs of disabled people in designing roadside infrastructure. So I wonder, Ed, whether you could very quickly, we've had a couple of questions in, one about how blind and visually impaired people get on and off bus if there's you know, a bus bypass, and also about kind of the height of curbs and so on. So how do you build design that meets the needs of disabled people into, into roadside infrastructure? 
I think at, at large large part it's about at that early planning stage recognizing this and building it into everyone's thinking that's involved in the process here so it's not uh, an afterthought which so sadly it can be but something that is considered by everyone all of the designers or the planners that it comes together to create the right type of environment for disabled people um, rather than you know separate exercises where you may have a bus bypass planned by a certain team of people a shelter installed by a certain other team of people and then you don't get this sort of joined up thinking and that's where you can get these um these these points of friction or these areas where things just don't work um so it's about joined up thinking uh, you know at the planning stage at the very early stage um and then you can uh, you know predict how the whole how the whole environment so not just within the shelter itself but around it uh, can be built to the needs of everybody uh, and things that are good for disabled people are good for everybody as well i think that's, that's a good point what ed's saying just very but one thing is that what ed said is people would normally employ an expert if you're you know you employ a transport planner if you're doing transport planning things if you'd employ an architect if you're building your house there are experts that exist like you know infrastructure experts like ed and his firm um, and other architects and planners that deal in the public transport infrastructure field and that's what we're saying is you know, use an expert get the right device plan it properly and create transformational products Thanks very much. Good advice. Um, I'm sorry we don't have time for more. We've had a lot more questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to them and we could talk all day about this. Thank you very much to everyone who joined us online. Thank you very much to our panellists, Claire Haig, Ivan Bennett, Ed Griffiths and Jonathan Morley. Remember, this will be recorded and on YouTube later. Thank you very much for watching.